In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. So every Sunday, we gather together in this place and we begin our worship by praying together to God through Jesus Christ by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. In fact, these words or some iteration of them are found at the conclusion of most every prayer we pray, and they acknowledge our belief in the mystery we know as the Holy Trinity. Throughout the centuries, theologians have attempted to define or describe this triune nature of God. For example, St. Augustine in his Confessions wrote, Can anyone comprehend the Almighty Trinity? Everyone talks about it, but is it really the Trinity of which they talk? People argue and wrangle over it, yet no one sees that vision unless he is at peace. And then there's this little gem written by St. Thalassius the Libyan. Paradoxically, the one moves from itself into the three and yet remains one, while the three return to the one and yet remain three. We confess unity and trinity, and trinity and unity, yet divided without division and united yet with distinctions. I find that the more I ponder these and the many other excellent theological discourses on the trinity, the more I can identify and appreciate how good old Nicodemus must have felt when he found himself touched and drawn into this message of Jesus. This itinerant preacher who was going around filling up people's heads and hearts with his scandalous message of unconditional love and hope restored. Nicodemus, who until then believed that he had this God stuff pretty well figured out, he comes to Jesus, though, under cover of darkness, literally and figuratively. And when Jesus talks to him about the need to be born from above, born of the water and spirit, to be touched by the wind, which is the very breath of God, and tells him, in fact, that Jesus, God's Son, is a love offering given to redeem all of creation, Nicodemus just sort of shrugs and he says, but how? How can these things be? That's a lot like how I feel when I read all of these profound ideas about how this God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all one, but at the same time, not one. The word Trinity isn't even found anywhere in Scripture, but comes to us because theologians in the early church attempted to put limits around what to this day remains obscure, beyond our limited knowing, and indescribable by mere language. Therefore, on this Trinity Sunday, I'm going to do the only sensible thing I can possibly do. I am not going to even try to explain the doctrine of the Trinity. For one thing, that might leave you with the notion that this or any doctrine holds some importance in its own right. So, if what you were hoping for it was a thoroughly intellectual explanation of the doctrine of Trinity, I apologize. And I invite you to read the excellent works of, written by those who have spent much of their life's energy attempting to provide us with words and symbols that help inform our understanding of God the Father God the Son and the Holy Spirit, in whose name we will baptize Merle and Bennett this morning and renew our own promises. What I propose instead is that we use what is in Scripture to remind the parents, Marty and Carolyn and Michael and Whitney, and the Godparents who will all stand before God and this community and promise to help Merle and Bennett grow into the full stature of Christ that admittedly, we can only do any of this with God's help. For you see, we are not the only ones making a promise here this morning. God is also making a promise to be present in the lives of these two babies always and everywhere as their source of life and of love and of grace. 
God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Marty, Carolyn, Michael, and Whitney, as a community of faith, we have the deep privilege and the solemn responsibility of standing witness with you as you offer your children to God in baptism. And for this chance today, we are so grateful. We know that the task ahead of you and us is not an easy one. But you know what? Nothing worthwhile is ever easy. As you juggle the many responsibilities and demands of your chosen professions and all the tasks, large and small, that go into just making it through every day, we affirm your commitment to do all in your power to live as a Christian household, especially when our larger culture thinks it's no longer meaningful. It is our role to support you as you teach Merle and Bennett to recognize God's voice in their lives when they hear it. It is our responsibility to help you give them roots and wings, roots of a faith tradition handed down through our ancestors that will grow deep within them and sustain them throughout their days, and wings so that when they hear the voice of God asking, whom shall I send, they, like Isaiah, will know what they are hearing and be able to respond, here am I, send me, and will walk the path laid out for them without fear, knowing they are never alone. And to Merle and Bennett, even though you don't understand this yet, we say welcome, welcome to your other larger family. Please remember that we are sometimes a bit chaotic and we are always imperfect, but we keep practicing to live as though God's kingdom is already here because it is. And today you will become its newest disciples. Just like us, you will make mistakes, and some things you try are going to fail. But the most important thing is that you continue to gather with us, listen for the voice of God who promises to be present in our midst, and keep telling the world about this radical love that is Jesus. Amen.